you want to come a bit closer? You're welcome to be. Uh, we can we can add autograph the coffees too if you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Thomas Schneider. I'm uh, with the Swiss government, representing our, our president here uh, this morning because my president, uh, Doris Leutart, um, is one of the stewards of the, of the WEF initiative on, on digital economy and society systems. And uh, we work in a number of, um, of areas with the WEF and with others, of course, uh, in, in these fields. And uh, unfortunately, Professor Glanray, who you know, he has fallen up a stair so uh, a few days ago. So otherwise, he would of course be here as well. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we have been in, in particularly uh, participating with, with a, a lot of interest and, and, and uh, commitment in this uh, in this part of the WEF's uh, uh, initiative, which is about uh, basically national digital strategies or digital protocols or, or whatever you call it. Um, because <coughs> we have uh, the view that this is, th it's very important to have a strategy, a digital strategy to know what your needs are, what your businesses and citizens needs are, the spe uh, special circumstances. And, and so uh, we have had in Switzerland a strategy on, as it was called at that time, the information society since 1998. Uh, of the federal government and we've updated it several times and I guess you probably have heard it like 10 times already this week. Our latest strategy is from last year. It's called Digital Switzerland. Um, we had uh, a number of, uh, of, let's say, consultations with, with, the, <laughs> with all stakeholders. It was uh, an iterative, re uh, inclusive process um, that, that we had and, and that uh, accumulating in a with the Swiss IGF and also accumulating in a big conference that we called National Digital Dialogue in November in, in Biel, where our offices are. And uh, the feedback of all of this will be used as the starting point of the next version of the strategy, which will be elaborated next year. So we have like come to a two-year cycle now. Also, the cycles get shorter and shorter, in particular with regard to, the, to measures or action points that uh, we always attach to a strategy. So this is the, the, and we have realized that this is a very useful thing and it's very appreciated uh, also by, by the stakeholders. Of course, they criticize us for everything that is not in there that some may care most, but that's of course then normal and it's an aggregate. So this is the reason why we, we joined this network and why uh, our president also acted as a co-steward um, in, in this particular network, um, because we think that the, uh, the outcome, which is this uh, playbook that, that you have also online, is a good collection of, of a number of examples of, or good practices of how uh, in some countries uh, these strategies are developed, what the processes are, what the outcomes look like, how, how, uh, how priorities are set. And there's a good sample of, of a variety of countries from different regions in the world. One of the contributions is from our side. And, and we think that this uh, really helps as a, to, to, first of all, better understand the issues, the challenges, also the opportunities uh, that this uh, digital transformation brings, and also to give a pragmatic tool where other interested governments or stakeholders can, can pick and choose what they think is, is, is fit or useful for them, uh, national situation, to be inspired, to copy, or to, to use as, a, as, as an inspiration, as I said to further develop their own strategies. So we would like to thank, uh, first of all, the WEF and all the partners for, for producing this because we think it's, a, it's a, a really useful tool. Thank you. So um, if we can go to the next, sorry, thank you. Okay, so just a bit of background, what the forum is trying to do. So the left-hand <coughs> side of the page indicates how the world traditionally has worked. A vertical siloed, uh, some cross, cross-networking, but a fairly vertical world. And of course, what we are seeing as we now enter the speed of all the changes happening with technology uh, is that we're moving to uh, a world that is all horizontally connected. And at the forum, uh, you know, we have the ability to bring together many of these different stakeholders, the multi-stakeholder <coughs> approach. And for many of you at IGF, this is not new. This is how the internet has developed. On the logical layer, the physical layer, it's been by default an expert-based 
horizontal network approach to how we then create the norms that eventually led to the internet. And our belief is that as now the internet moves into what we call the fourth industrial revolution, uh, you're seeing the same need to have these multi-stakeholder expert driven networks come up with how do we address issues like artificial intelligence, all the privacy issues related to AI or, or the safety and security issues related to IoT and on and on and on. And so conceptually what we wanted to do at the forum was how can we apply this model to creating protocols or actual solutions on, in this case, the issues of national digital policy. Now national digital policy is a little different because you can't set up, come up with a set of uh, 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 menus for a government to just say implement and now they have their national digital policy. However, could we, and we formed a group of experts around this, um, could we put together a group of experts, and it was chaired by President Lothar, as, uh, as mentioned earlier, and also uh, uh, Luis Moreno, the president of the Inter-American Development Bank. They chaired this group, and we have one of our network members here. Could they put together at least some kind of a framework or some best practices or some case studies on how to help guide national digital policy making? So the next slide. And that's what we call the digital protocol network. So we created a digital protocol no network on national digital policy, groups of experts that came together. Um, and in this case, uh, they've come up with this playbook, we call it, which frames uh, and provides solutions for governments looking to address some of the challenges they're facing in policy making. Let me hand that over now over to one of our uh, members of the uh, expert network, James Johns, who's going to present the highlights. Thank you, Alex. Uh, one of the reasons I really enjoy being involved in this work is that I get to be called an expert, which doesn't happen <laughs> very often in my uh, life. Can you move to the next slide, please? Um, so when the, when the network uh, group first got together, the, the questions that we started asking ourselves were, what, what could we produce that would be useful to policymakers in different countries um, as they face the challenges of, of creating or, or updating their own uh, national digital policy uh, uh, approaches to different aspects of digital governance. Uh, and as Alex said, this is something that can't really be done with uh, an off-the-shelf uh, approach. So we spent some time in looking at the sorts of challenges that um, the policymakers are, are facing um, in, in terms of uh, digital policy. And what became apparent um, quite early on, I suppose, are two, two, two factors. Firstly, um, the issues that you're facing from a, a digital policymaking point of view evolve over time as your nation's uh, adaption of, of the internet changes. So obviously sort of foundationally you have the question about how you provide the right levels of infrastructure and access to the internet. Then how do you govern and harness um, technical innovations? Um, and then as, uh, as your uh, use of the internet matures as a nation, you then get into the questions of strategy and policy um, and governance and so on. But uh, uh, this slide probably doesn't do justice to the complexity of that set of challenges because, of course, these things are not linear. Um, they, they, um, the, the, the totality of internet governance, of, of, of digital governance, really just builds um, and, and gets ever more complicated. And just for examples of that, we can see that this week, for example, in, even in the UK, which is a relatively well-developed uh, digital economy, the government uh, is, has launched another universal service obligation on its national uh, telecoms provider to, to create a, a commitment to 10 megabit um, per second broadband access as a national goal. Uh, and at the same time, in the European Court this week, at the, at the right-hand end of our chart, we've seen the European Court determine that Uber is uh, a, a taxi company, not an intermediary, um, and, and must be governed in that way. So the, the set of challenges facing governmental organisations in this space are, 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 are ever more complicated, and, and as I say, they, they don't go away. Uh, so if we could see the next slide. Um, so having discussed this, the, the network decided that we wanted to do something that really focused on, on the, the four key pillars of, um, of the kind of the economic and societal layers defined in ICANN's model for, for internet governance. Uh, so specifically around access, around commerce, around security and trust, and around content. Um, and they've translated into the work that we did as a, as a network, uh, and manifested themselves in the, the, the way that the playbook is constructed. Um, by, by the, the chapters that we've chosen. And if we could just flick through the next four builds. Uh, so we have chapters in the, uh, in the playbook on innovation in digital governance, uh, growing the digital economy related to the commerce uh, layer, protecting digital infrastructure, business and rights, which is the security and trust layer, and then developing a smart society, which is really focused around the, 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 the e-government aspects of, of content. If we could flick to the next slide. So the, the first two deliverables from the, uh, from the network, uh, both of which are encompassed in the, the playbook, are the playbook itself uh, and what we've called our digital policy model canvas. And I'll spend a little bit of time explaining the rationale behind both of those. 
Um, the playbook, um, w uh, w and we deliberately chose the term playbook, recognizing its link back to, to, to American football. And now I'm not an expert on that particular sporting discipline, but my understanding is that the, uh, the way that, that the, the game works is that um, teams have a, a set of defined plays that they will execute in response to a particular set of circumstances. And as the game progresses, the playmaker, somebody who's uh, in charge of the team, the captain, I guess, um, will call a particular play out to respond to what's going on on the, the pitch at that particular time. And we felt that that was probably a better way of structuring um, our, our response than, than the kind of the menu uh, system that which Alex has already discounted as, as being not appropriate. Um, what we wanted to do is to say that there are very different challenges facing governments as they create digital policy and what they could potentially do is look at the playbook and call a play in response to a particular set of circumstances that was right for their nation. Now, of course, um, not all plays will be right for every nation in every circumstance, but we've tried to set out in the playbook um, the circumstances that led to that play being appropriate in a given, uh, a given nation. Um, and then the second part is the policy canvas. And anyone who's, who's done an MBA or studied uh, business strategy will be familiar with this, this kind of technique. Um, it's a, a, a very simple tool, basically a single side of, of, of paper which has a, a series of prompts on it uh, for the features that you need to have included in a digital policy of, of any, any particular sort. And it's, it's really intended to, um, to be used to structure and to challenge policymakers as they're going through the process of, of designing a policy by getting them to focus on the, 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 the goals that they're aiming to, that they're trying to tackle, uh, the stakeholders that they're, they're, they're involved in, whether they're the beneficiaries of the policy or people involved in its delivery, the risks uh, uh, that must be tackled and so on. And I'll come to that in a little bit more detail. But we have the two deliverables in the playbook and far many uh, more copies than we need on the table there in front of you to, to take away. So if we could flick on, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit of detail about what's in the playbook. We've got 17 different countries represented from every different part of the world. And I was aware when I said that, that um, there's a, a, what looks to be a big gaping hole in North America, but technically I think Costa Rica is in North America, so I think we can, we can claim it's, it's all parts of the world. Um, 17 countries, um, each covering uh, one of the four aspects of the, uh, of the digital policy challenge um, and, and tackling a very different aspect of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of digital policy making. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the chapters and the, uh, the way that the, 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 the plays have panned out. So if you could probably flick to the first page. The first chapter is really around um, digital governance and access. Um, and this, uh, this chapter has, uh, has five case studies in from Brazil, Colombia, Rwanda, Lebanon, and Switzerland. Uh, Thomas has already described uh, the particular circumstance in Switzerland. Um, and in each of these chapters, we describe a play uh, that's been executed by, uh, by the government or by a combination of, of um, civil society organizations working together. And we try and extract from that the, the kind of key, the key lesson um, that can be um, uh, that, that can be that can be learned. So in Brazil, for example, um, the Brazilian government very explicitly set out to create a multi-stakeholder approach to its internet governance when it created the uh, the CGI Brazil, the, the, the kind of central committee for internet governance. Uh, in Colombia, the the government uh, executed a plan called Vive Digital, which was about how it would um, raise internet access and uh, and, and gain more. Um, encourage people to make more use of ICT, um, uh, leading to the fact that Colombia now has uh, some of the leading connectivity speeds in, in Latin America. Uh, Rwanda and Lebanon, both absolutely fascinating examples because um, th this e these are situations where governments uh, or, or, or um, civil society organizations have had to take steps to, uh, to use technology to kind of rebuild a nation after uh, many years of conflict. Um, and, and certainly from my point of view, having grown up in a, a country where we take uh, this sort of thing for granted, very humbling to learn about the, um, the activities of, of, of both, uh, both governments. If we could flick on to the next slide. Uh, chapter two, uh, developing a smart society in public services. As I said, this is really focused around uh, digital government um, initiatives. Uh, and we have some of the, um, the kind of poster children, if you like, for these kind of initiatives around the world, uh, particularly Singapore and Estonia, who, who are obviously always um, at the top of any list uh, that you see when we're talking about success in these policy areas. Um, India, which has done uh, an amazing, uh, amazing job of uh, creating a, a national digital identity platform to make it easy to access uh, e-government services. Um, and 
one that I guess that's in, amongst this set that stands out as perhaps being a, a, a little bit of a different approach in the United Arab Emirates, where the nature of the government that they have there and the size of the country has led to a more directive, kind of top-down approach to digital government services, but nevertheless one that has been very successful at delivering the digital dividend. Um, I think one of the key insights that we learned from this is that there is no one fixed solution that um, you know, governance particularly has to reflect the size and the nature of the, the state that, um, that you're implementing e-government services in. Uh, as I said, you know, the, the difference between, say, a UAE model and the Estonian model being, being probably the most stark here. If you could flick to the next slide, please. Um, chapter three, growing the digital economy. Um, again, some very diverse examples here of um, countries that have made a success of uh, stimulating growth it, both in their native um, uh, uh, high-tech companies in encouraging investment from, uh, from other uh, 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 technology companies from, from other nations um, and also in digitizing traditional industries. Um, this is the chapter which, uh, which I was most involved in, so it's the one I'm most familiar with. In, with. Um, but if we look at the, the kind of interventions that have, have been adopted here, they range from uh, in Sweden, for example, where the government... Um, uh, made available about 15 or 20 years ago, subsidised access to PCs, um, uh, which, which basically led to pretty much every household in Sweden getting access to its first computer through this route. And as a result of that, plus um, uh, deregulation in their, uh, their telecom sector and having quite a benign environment from an entrepreneurial point of view, I mean, they have um, n n nothing in the way of, of, of um, fees for university access and their welfare system is very strong so big, being an entrepreneur is actually quite a risk-free step to take uh, in Sweden and as a result despite the fact that there's only a population of about four and a half million they have um, some of the world's leading and, and, and most successful uh, internet companies uh, companies like Skype were born in, in Sweden you have uh, games companies like King and Moang um, who are uh, very very valuable um, countries that companies that have grown out of the Swedish digital economy um, Costa Rica, very, very different approach though. Similar size, I guess, in terms of population to, um, to Sweden. But their approach has been to recognize that they probably don't have very much to offer in terms of market size to companies who want to invest in Costa Rica. Um, but they've used um, tax incentives um, and a commitment to free trade to drive investment from other technology companies. So they have a very, very vibrant um, economy based on... Um, uh, multinational technology companies being based in Costa Rica. They have a free trade zone, which basically allows uh, companies operating there to, to avoid any kind of corporation taxes or taxes on capital investment. Um, and although they've seen some um, fluctuation in the, uh, the, the kind of investments of individual companies over the years, you know, people have come and, and built large investments which have then reduced or gone away, overall the, um, the, the economy is very, very vibrant. And that is now starting to trigger investment in, in, in a native digital sector in a way that probably wouldn't have been seen were it not for that, um, that initial set of, uh, of, of investments from, from, from outside. Um, Kenya again, sorry, I'll just finish on that one, because Kenya again was a very, very interesting example. Um, probably the, the, the pivotal moment um, in, in Kenya's development as a digital nation was it breaking ranks with the other African nations to put its own subsea cable in. It's invested in something called the Teams Cable, the East Africa Marine. Uh, cable which connected um, Kenya to um, the uh, internet access via the Middle East for the first time uh, and Kenya has now become a kind of a, a connection point for other countries into the internet um, and there's been a stimulation of um, both native and uh, foreign investment in, in digital, uh, digital companies as a result of, of the, the better access that they've got. So it's interesting how just a single act on behalf of government can be pivotal in driving uh, economic growth. Thank you. And then the last chapter uh, really related to cybersecurity. Um, four case studies here from Israel, Australia, Japan, and Germany. Um, probably the one in which there is the least difference in terms of what has been done. Um, this is really all about um, the creation of national cybersecurity policies um, linked to an attempt to, 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 to support economic growth. But the rationale in each case has been quite different. Australia... Um, uh, uh, I think very much felt that it was kind of behind the curve compared to its peer com countries, both economically and in terms of the other members of the, the Five Eyes security community that it's a member of, um, and put a lot, so it's put a lot of effort into kind of leapfrog um, its position. Uh, Japan, um, again, national cybersecurity 
policy, but prompted very much by uh, its hosting of the Olympic Games. And Germany, where uh, they probably have amongst Europe some of the most um, kind of I I interested and activist uh, sort of organizations in terms of digital rights and, and access to data. So Germany's policy has been very much around um, using uh, cybersecurity policy to establish trust in organizations that hold personal data and making them demonstrate that they're doing that in a, in a, in a, uh, a way which is, uh, which is trustworthy. Um, so there we've got the four chapters from the, um, uh, fr from the playbook, 17 case studies. Um, we hope that people will go away and read those and find something in them that they can apply to their own uh, digital policy activities. If you could flick on to the next last, the last couple of slides then here. This relates to the, um, the canvas. Um, and the canvas, uh, as I said, is, um, is based on something that um, will be very familiar to people who've done work on, on business, um, uh, business strategy modeling, um, uh, the sort of thing that you might learn uh, through a, a, an MBA, that kind of program. Um, and this was uh, put together by, uh, principally through, through the network by uh, Stefan Verhulst from the, the GovLab at NYU. Um, and uh, Stefan has written some, some really interesting stuff on how to, to apply the canvas. And we've, we've got a, a, a link at the end of the presentation to uh, some material that Stefan's written. Um, as I said, it basically intended to be a, a tool to help people as they construct their own policies. And it's a, a series of prompts, if you like, to, to remind you what you need to be asking about. Um, we clearly don't have the, you know, the view that, that digital policy must be able to be written on a si single side of A4 paper, although, of course, if you can summarize it down to that level, that's, uh, that's probably quite, uh, quite a good discipline. Um, but the, 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 um, the headings are intended to be prompts that will, um, will give you pause for thought and make you think about, you know, have I actually tackled this aspect of the policy in sufficient detail? Um, have I got the metrics uh, and the data I need to support this set of decisions and outcomes that we're proposing? Um, and what you'll find in the playbook is a worked example, which we can see on the, the next slide, where we've uh, effectively reverse engineered the, um, the Rwanda policy into the, uh, into the canvas here. Um, and I won't go into the detail, because you probably can't read that on the slide anyway. The writing is, is pretty small. Uh, but we took the 2020-2050 um, the, uh, the plan that Rwanda put together uh, to, uh, to, to, to use technology to rebuild in the wake of their conflict and decomposed it into the, uh, into the canvas here. Um, I'd probably the, the one thing that we just need to do very quickly, I guess, is, um, is note that, that from, from a sort of usability point of view, uh, this has revealed that there was nothing about risk in the Rwandan policy. So, it, if, if for no other purpose, it's highlighted a kind of a gap in the uh, in the thinking. Okay, if we could flick to the the, the next slide, um, I won't go into the detail of this. I've talked about some of the lessons learned uh, as we've gone through the, um, the, the the deck, but I would just like to finish with. Uh, uh, the next slide, if we can, which has got um, a couple of, uh, couple of prompts on it. Playbook and Canvas were launched in September. The feedback so far has been very good. We, uh, we very much welcome more feedback, so we would like other people to look at it. Either a paper copy you can get today or you can download it. And we would like people to provide us with their thoughts on whether these are useful tools to help policymakers um, and whether there are other things that the network could be doing to build uh, mechanisms to share best practices and share lessons amongst the global policymaking community. I will leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, I think we're technically done with the session, but um, if there's any questions or there was only a handful of you in the room, just come talk to us. Bill, Bill there is, uh, was the project manager at the forum that did this. Uh, so, but if there's any questions, um, please take the chance right now. Okay, well otherwise, thank you for uh, your joining the session. Please take a copy of the playbook if you haven't had one, but better yet, go online and, uh, and pull it down and we'll also have a space to get comments. I guess I should just end by saying, this is not meant to be like the be all end all. It was meant, it's meant to be the baseline of a living document. And, and I think we've created some space where people can submit additional ideas and, and case studies. Uh, where the forum, whether the forum can continue to support this beyond the next couple months, we're not sure. We'll see how many people are, are um, keeping this up to date. But otherwise, as a standalone piece, uh, that's our contribution to this issue. So thanks very much.